sponsored by NordVPN. I got tired of juggling these small SSDs for my backups and I knew I needed a better solution eventually. But first I wanted to experiment with this low power single board computer called the Zima board. I'm pairing it with a bunch of second hand drives I had lying around to create a compact home server. Something like a Synology NAS but fully 3D printed. In this video I'll show you how I designed and built this custom 6 bay enclosure and its power adapter PCB from scratch. Let's get started. Before jumping into the design, let's define few goals to keep the scope manageable. I plan to fully 3D print the enclosure, but I don't want to deal with slicing and gluing parts, so I'll try to design everything to fit in a standard printer bed in one piece. I currently have 4 or 5 drives for this project, but I'd like to leave room to add more later. Also, swapping drives with a bunch of screws sounds tedious, so I want to explore some sort of a toolless mechanism like the ones found in a real commercial NAS. One thing I found annoying about the Zima board is it doesn't have a power button. You either have to initiate shutdown from the OS you're running or simply yank the cable. So we'll make sure to add one in this build. If you're wondering about the specs of the Zima board, I'll be using the 832 variant with the Intel quad-core Celeron and 8 gigs of RAM, which is somewhat comparable to what you'd find in some entry-level NAS devices. Full disclosure, this one was sent to me for free by Icewell, but this is not a review and I was planning to use one for this project anyway. Next up, power. The Zima board ships with a 12V 3A adapter which is enough for the board and two hard drives. They even make these custom cables to power them both from the middle connector. But since we want to support four or more drives, we'll definitely need another way to power the entire system. There are several options for NAS software, and the Zima board conveniently comes pre-installed with one of them. Casa OS. It's a simple user-friendly way to set up file storage and self-host few services using Docker. A popular project to start with is hosting your own VPN server. While that lets you securely remote into your network, it doesn't cover your outbound internet traffic. And that's where today's sponsor NordVPN comes in. I've been using NordVPN for years, well before they sponsored this video. I run the app on most of my daily devices, so whether I'm home or on the go, connecting securely takes just one tap. They have thousands of servers around the world to encrypt your internet traffic and easily access your favorite geo-restricted content. More recently, I've started routing entire network segments like my untrusted IoT devices through a NordVPN client directly on my router. That way, even when they report back to the mothership, their traffic is at least encrypted and my public IP stay hidden from any sketchy vendors. Another thing I appreciate about Nord is they claim to follow a strict no-log policy, which means they don't track, collect or share your private data. Right now you can get a huge discount on the 2 year plan plus an extra 4 months for free by heading to nordvpn.com slash salim. This is the best deal currently available online and is completely risk free with a 30 day money back guarantee. Again that's nordvpn.com slash salim or click in the link down below. Now let's jump back into Fusion and get started on the design. The first thing I started working on was the drive caddy. I referenced the generic hard drive datasheet to make sure I have the correct dimensions and spacing for the mounting holes. Usually you'd secure the drives with screws from the sides, but since this is 3D printed, I designed small nubs that will simply cache into the holes and I left the option to use screws on the bottom of course. Each of the caddies slides into a dedicated channel. To ensure drives don't accidentally pop out, I added two flexible ears with small locating feature on each end. I also offset the sliding guide a bit off-center making it easier to naturally align the drives when inserting them. Typically on a commercial NAS you would find a backplane with integrated connectors. But that's not something I can replicate for this build, instead I opted for a simpler solution using these SATA couplers at the back, precisely aligned them so that the drive can dock directly. If you're wondering about these 6 holes, that's how I'll pull together the entire drive cage using 6 threaded rods secured with bolts. Before moving on, I did few tests to tweak the spacing. Once I was confident in that, I added the drive covers which used the threaded rod as rotational axis and magnets to hold them open. I then duplicated a few units and started building the main enclosure. I think 6 bays is a good start, and that's the most we can fit in the boundary we set before. Stacking them closely together will build up heat, so I included separators between the drives and kept the sides partially open to allow some airflow and better cooling. Speaking of cooling, I'll be using two of these 80mm Noctua fans to force air through the gaps behind the drives and keep them cool. I extruded a base below the drive case to get a sense of the remaining space we have for the rest of the components. I then added two smaller 40mm exhaust fan and this illuminated power button to the front. To complete the enclosure structure, we're using two plates and a set of braces to contain the drive cage assembly and the base. I'll add more mounting points and finer details later, but for now let's tackle a more immediate concern, powering the entire system. Here's what I've had to account for so far. 
The Zima board draws between 6 watts at idle and up to 16 watts under load, 4 cooling fans at another 4 watts at most, and for the 6 pace power requirements depend significantly on whether we use 3.5 inch drives or 2.5 inch SSDs. A worst case scenario would be with 6 3.5 hard drives means roughly 72 watts on the 12 volt rail and about 25 watts on the 5 volt rail. On the other hand, 6 SSDs will only need about 50 watts on the 5 volt rail alone. So I need a power supply that can provide at least 10 amps each on the 12 volt and 5 volt rails. After a quick search on Amazon, I found a cheap multi-output power supply typically used in arcade machines. According to the description in the product label, it can deliver 12 amps at 12 volt, 10 amps at 5 volt, and has a 24 volt rail that we want to use. I decided to go with it, a decision that I later regretted, but let's stick with it for now. Another issue I had to account for is controlling the power rails. See, a regular motherboard shares a few signals with the ATX power supply to verify that outputs are ok and to turn on and off the power for the rest of the system. This setup doesn't have that, meaning everything will stay on even after shutting down the Zima board. I checked the documentation and found two unused IO headers with a common header pitch. Apparently they can handle power in and give you access to a power switch and other pins. My plan was to design a custom adapter PCB to distribute power from the power supply and use one of these, likely the LED signal, to switch power for both the drives and cooling fans. However, soldering the headers on the Zima board quickly became a nightmare. The pads were already flooded with solder and the holes were way too small. This made seeding the connectors pretty difficult. I've tried with solder wick, hot air and different techniques but I only could get them to go halfway and had to stop in fear of damaging the pads. Heads up, if you ever attempt this yourself, it's not a pleasant experience at all. Worst. Despite the struggle, the pins made good contact and I connected a simple push button and confirmed that the power button worked and the LED pin signal pulled high when the Zima board powered up and went back to ground when it shut down. Now I just need some sort of electronic switch. Normally, a simple low side switch with an end channel MOSFET would do the trick, but since we're dealing with hard drives and logic boards, I didn't want to disconnect the ground only. So instead, I put together the circuit with two P channel MOSFETs for high side switching and two transistors that pull the gates to ground when the LD goes high, turning the power on and off based on the state of that pin. To complete the adapter board, I added few connectors for the cooling fans, Molex connectors to split power for the drives, and fuses on each rail for good measure. I'll order these PCBs with thicker 2 ounce copper to improve current capabilities and heat dissipation for the MOSFETs. These headers should align with those I soldered on the Zima board previously. I've also broken out a connector for the front power button. With that done, I can send the design off to our friends at PCBWay and work on the rest of the enclosure. After placing the power supply, I just had enough space to fit the Zima board next to it. But since the Zima board only has two SATA ports and we want to connect up to six drives, I will be using this PCIe expansion card and a 90 degree riser cable. Although the parts were modeled as solid, I plan to use a slicer trick by removing the top and bottom walls and tweaking infill settings to print them as meshes and allow air to flow through them. For the drive cage and some structural parts, I was worried about the heat buildup. So I picked this glass fiber reinforced ABS from Bamboo Lab. It's rated for high heat resistant up to 99 degrees and seemed easier to print compared to regular ABS. For the external parts like the drive covers and mesh panels, I went with regular black PETG. I prepared all the print plates arranging the different parts, some of which will need multiple batches and started to send them one by one to the printer. Aside from a slight layer shift on the base piece, which was totally my fault, printing went smoothly overall. After a few days, I had these two piles of parts ready for assembly. The only cleanup needed was removing the brim on the ABS pieces, which I quickly did using this deburring tool on all the edges. With the parts cleaned up, I moved on installing all the heated inserts. To keep things simple and organized, I used mostly M3 fasteners for the whole project. In the meantime, the adapter PCB arrived, so I started assembling the electronics with the SMD components.
After that I added the wire terminals, fuses and two power connector and it was time to test the circuit. I was skeptical about the cheap power supply so I brought this electronic load tester to see if it actually can deliver what's claimed on the label. After crimping a few wires I used a multimeter to confirm the voltages are actually ok without any load and started testing. On the 5V side I gradually increased the load and managed to get closer to the 10 amps as claimed, although there was a some voltage sag it wasn't as bad as indicated on the tester. Checking with the thermal camera the MOSFETs and surrounding copper stayed cool enough which was also reassuring. Unfortunately, testing the 12V rail didn't go as smoothly. As soon as I creeped around 7.5 amps, the voltage sagged significantly and the fuse exploded. I was able to get a replacement from Amazon but was pretty certain that I encountered the same issue again. So I didn't bother testing but I will be mindful of the total load in the system. Moving forward, I added the remaining through hole connectors but then discovered that I made another stupid mistake. I used the same connectors to those on the splitters instead of the maiden ones. Luckily, I can fix this with a few of these from DigiKey that I ordered with the right housing this time. I will be making two small jumpers to bridge between the PCB connector and the power splitters. I tried to find the alternative connector that I could solder directly on the PCB but it seems that those aren't very common so the jumper will do the trick for now. It's time to assemble everything starting from the base. I mounted two small exhaust fans at the front, secured the power supply and shortened the cables I used for testing for a cleaner fit. I also extended the power button wires using some DuPont jumpers and plugged them into the right angle header. Before adding the drives I did a quick power on test with the Zima board to verify everything was functioning. Next I connected three drives using the Molex splitters and tested the SATA expansion cards to confirm that the drives appeared properly in Casa OS. Curious about the power consumption, I added a 4 drive and monitored the system using a power meter. These 7000 RPM drives are quite power hungry. They pull around 160 watts during initial spin up before settling down around 45 watts. If you're planning on using something similar, you definitely want to upgrade that power supply. I think I'll stick to using 3 or 4 of these mechanical drives and fill the remaining base with SSDs to keep the power demands manageable. Next, I moved on to assembling the drive cage, starting by styling all the SATA couplers into the drive slots. Depending on the print tolerances and the threaded rods you'll get, you might need to slightly enlarge the six holes for a smoother assembly. I began with one of the plates using nylon washers for spacing and advanced the rods one at a time. I also glued magnets intended to hold the drive covers open but later realized that the friction from the bolts and nylon washer alone was enough to keep them open. Finally, I combined the drive cage and the base, carefully managing cables in the less accessible spots before sliding the cage on top and securing it with the M3 screws on both sides. At this point, I plugged all the drive bays, installed the final back plates in the two fans, and check the temperature once more with the thermal camera. All remained was adding the mesh panels to the side and front and the assembly was complete. Here is the final result.
This was a fun experiment to build and I'm happy with how it turned out. Of course, there is plenty of possible improvements and several mistakes that I made. But like with most of these projects, it's more about the process and I really hope you found something useful in it. I'm planning on keeping this as a redundant backup and to test few self-hosted services. If you're interested in the performance of this kind of setup, there are a lot of cool home lab channels that cover this extensively. I'll link some of them down below. And if you're planning to build something similar, I highly recommend you upgrade the power supply. Or keep and check your total power requirements. As always, all the files and build instructions will be linked down below. Thanks again to NordVPN for making this video possible. And thank you for watching. I will see you in the next one. <laughs>